Alright, hi everyone. Today we've got a bit of a different video. I just want to give you a breakdown of some abstract architecture scenes I've made recently. These are completely improvised scenes, so they weren't following any references. But I thought I might take the opportunity to share with you some techniques I use to achieve the visual results, and also take the time to talk about some techniques I use for improvising scenes from imagination. This is something I touch on in quite a few other videos, so hopefully I can elaborate on that a bit more in this video. And just so you know, this video is not scripted like most of the other videos, so it might feel a bit more like a lecture. Before we start, if you want to get a hold of the files, they are available on my Patreon under the $10 tier, which gets you access to my art files, both experimental and completed. So let's begin. We're going to start off by taking a look at this scene first, which is actually the second one I made. This is the end result on the left, and this is the start result on the right. You can see there's a fair number of differences, really just some extra detail, but mostly this ceiling or covering structure. Generally, when I start something from scratch, so for example, if I'm making a scene and I don't know what I want the end result to be, but maybe I have an inkling of the kind of shape I want to make, there are two main approaches that I take. The first one, which is not representative in this scene, is to start from a line of symmetry. So for example, we could have a back wall and a pathway going down and then say we have the pathway going up to the wall and then we can have all different kinds of symmetrical elements going on. This is more the kind of thing that we will see in the next example. But for this artwork, a technique I use is to have a path to follow. And you can see that very clearly in the image. So very different from the symmetry, we have a path. Now, of course, you can combine these two techniques if you want, but we're not going to talk about that here. So I started off from having a basic path, and when you have a path and you know the position of your camera, then you get a sense of where the empty space is going to be. You can see that if we ignore everything else in the scene here, there's quite a lot of empty space to the right of the path here, and slightly less but still a significant amount to the left. So to kind of give us an idea for what amount of space we have to fill in with details, like this bench and this character here, we can place down walls or boundaries that separate us from the infinite horizon. And what I mean by that is if we look into the background here, I'm using the sky feature in Blender 2.9, the horizon goes on forever. And ideally we don't want to show that in the render because it's not very realistic. So obviously an easy way to avoid that is by having an enclosed scene. So we have the boundary which goes all the way around the scene. I was really keen on sticking with the faceted low poly style for the covering here, but as you can see from the end result, I ended up changing that. But as I say, once you place down a boundary to separate yourself from the horizon, then what you essentially do is you define the space that you can use for extra details. Now one reason I like to use characters here, even if they're not detailed, is because they significantly help with giving a sense of scale. And we will see this in more detail with the other example later, where it's actually harder to identify the scale without having a character. It's not so bad in this image, because the distance between the foreground and the background is not that far. And we all generally have an understanding for what the average width of a pavement should be that can fit at least two people walking side by side. Now the modifier system in Blender is really powerful and also a good source of inspiration. And I'm sure that those of you who have been using Blender for a while know exactly how this ceiling was constructed. What we're essentially doing is taking the original faceted boundary here, then we're applying a subsurf modifier to it, and then we're using a wireframe modifier to essentially get these shapes in between where all of the faces are. But there's actually a couple of extra steps happening here which we'll talk about in a minute. Before we move on I'll talk about some of the other things going on in this picture. You can see that I have this extra sign here on the left and the reason for that is because there was too much empty space there. Now we've already got human-like characters on the right here so there's no point having them on the left as well. What's better done is to give the scene some signage which I think gives it a little bit of storytelling even if it doesn't make sense. And because I love using emissive lighting we can see some of the lighting bleeding up from the base of this sign. Basically the faces at the bottom of this segment are assigned a different emissive material and it's set to an extremely high strength so it bleeds up the darker PBR material. A simple emissive strip is put around the base of the boundary and what this does is it points upwards to give us more interesting definition along the wireframe of the boundary. This is helped by having a high contrast between the supporting structure and the background because if the background was as reflective as the supporting structure then the supports wouldn't look as unique because the light would be reflecting off the background in the same way. So having it like this means we get these interesting pieces of lighting coming off of the supports. But you'll notice there's still a lot of empty space going on. And if you don't know what kind of 3D details to put in there, then there is one cheap but really cool trick you can use. Reflections. Basically, you can use the content already in your scene to make things more interesting by simply reducing the roughness on the principled BSDF shader. Now, of course, you should only exploit reflections where it's appropriate. If you use them everywhere, this scene will look very cluttered and complex and weird. But I think for a floor like this, it works pretty well. So the vast majority of the lighting in this scene is coming from the emissive strips around the outside, but also if you look very carefully on the right here, you'll see that there's some yellowy light coming in. 
And this is because, as referenced earlier, if we take a look at one of the original images, we have the Blender 2.9 sky going on here. Now the reason it's bleeding in on the right is because this is what our structure looks like. So we basically have our outside boundary here, the camera is pointing inwards this way, and we have light which can bounce off of this surface and come in and then affect the objects here. I think this is fine because without it the scene is a bit too dark and if you look carefully even though the character is black there's still some subtle very faint yellow light bouncing off of him. The viewer looking at an image like this has no idea what's behind the camera so it's perfectly safe to have different even faked sources of lighting coming in from the outside so long as it's not so powerful to the point where the rest of the content inside of the scene stops making sense. Now let's take another look at the wireframe supporting structure. So if you look down at these images See here on the left I have the modifier stack which I use to get the supporting structure. But on the right here we have two different versions. The bottom image here shows the kind of behavior you would expect from a wireframe modifier applied to a basic shape which has a subsurf modifier applied. And that's because it's working from basic, easy to trace quad geometry. Essentially the grid lines up with the boundaries of the original shape. But one little trick if you want to rotate the shape of the grid to get these diamond type structures without affecting the boundaries of the original shape is to use the decimate modifier and set the mode to unsubdivide and then set the iterations to 1. At 0 we will end up with the regular grid and at 1 we will end up with the diamond grid. And you can see here that while still not too bad it's much less interesting to have the much more uniform grid going on. I'm sure this would look fine with a lower subsurf value for some kind of old underground bunker but for the purpose of having a more abstract sci-fi type environment then I think the diamond structure is a lot better because it looks more interesting as it curves around and follows the path down. Now when making these kinds of scenes I like to try and keep things as minimal as possible within reason but there are of course some big exceptions to that as you'll see when I show you the other scene. But for adding detail to simple objects there's one type of material that I found myself using quite a lot and it's basically just a simple PBR with a certain amount of reflectivity and this kind of splatter effect which is just generated from a Voronoi texture. So if we look to the right here, you can see how that's constructed. We're passing any kind of appropriate vector you like into a Voronoi texture set to smooth F1, so we get a smoother result. The scale is set to 200, and with a color ramp, we have the darker value and the lighter value plugging into the base color. So that gets you this pattern. Now if we look back up to the final image, you can see that this is used in more than one place. So of course we have it on the bench, but we also have it on the path, and we have it on the reflective floor. But each of these uses has different degrees of subtlety depending on the lighting. So I think it's a good multi-purpose material. It's kind of stylized and kind of ambiguous in implying extra detail on the surface. In the spirit of keeping things as minimal as possible, it really is a question of how little can you do to imply more detail in the scene. But that's not the end of it because when I take renders out of Blender, I like to manipulate them slightly in Affinity Designer, which is some software I use every day. It is paid software, I don't know how much it costs in other parts of the world, but I think for the UK it costs about £48.99, so it should be somewhere within the same range for dollars. And the reason I like using Affinity Designer is because their algorithms for brightness, contrast and vibrance are surprisingly good. You see in other softwares, when you increase the brightness of an image, it's almost like it just adds a layer of white on top of the image, which kind of dilutes the original pixels until everything is blown out and completely white. But in Affinity Designer, it doesn't really do that. It takes the content that's already in the image and then just amplifies it to a higher brightness. And I really like the way it looks, especially if you increase the contrast as well, because it tends to sharpen things up quite a bit. Now this example here is a bit extreme, I didn't go this high for the final picture, I'm just showing it for demonstration. But the one other effect I like to use when editing my final pictures is to increase the vibrancy. Now vibrance and saturation are two different things. This might be news to you if you haven't played around with photo manipulation before. Now whereas saturation affects every pixel in the scene by amplifying its color, what vibrance does is it specifically looks for the areas of the image that has dull colors, and then with a bias towards those, it increases their saturation disproportionately to the pixels in the scene that already have a high saturation. So I can look back to the unedited image here, and then back to the one with higher vibrancy. And you can see that a lot of the gaps in between these structural supports are affected and also the middle section here for the signage is also quite heavily affected probably to a degree that's a bit too high for our liking but again i have just increased this value for the sake of demonstration but anyway moving on we're going to take a look at the other scene this one's quite different because as i said instead of using the path technique to build the scene from scratch i'm using the symmetry technique and as you can see here, if I draw the line, we have a line going down the back wall and then coming down this pathway. This tends to lead us to a focal point where the eye is drawn first. 
And of course we have our character here for scale. Now the reason why it's important to have more than one character for this scene is because the distance between the back wall and the camera is actually quite far. But because we've got the camera lined up along the path without any good points of reference along the way, it's hard to tell exactly how far this gateway is from our foreground character. So by having people of the same size further away towards the gateway, we can get a sense for kind of how far away things are. Now I'm sure that the eye is drawn towards these wall sections. This has been achieved by using adaptive subdivision, which is part of the experimental feature set in Cycles. To get this to work, you will need to, of course, set your feature set to experimental. Then under these subdivision settings, which may actually be further down, but I've just moved mine up here for the sake of reference. Here you'll be able to set the dicing rate for the render and the viewport as well as the max subdivisions. This essentially says to which degree a surface using adaptive subdivision can be subdivided. So areas closer to the camera will have a higher density of geometry and areas further away from the camera will have a lower density of geometry. Once you have these settings activated, then on the objects that you want to apply this effect to, you need to provide them with a subdivision surface modifier. Now with the experimental feature set active, you will see different settings in here from what you would usually see. And the reason I'm using simple here is because I want to maintain the planar shape of this wall. If I used Catmull Clark, then it will round off the edges of this plane. Now as for the actual material nodes, we can have a look over here. What I essentially did was take a texture from texturehaven.com, which I highly recommend because they're providing CC0 textures for people to use. They also have a Patreon, so if you've ever used their service and you find it helpful, then consider donating to help them keep the service running. So I'm using the texture known as Medieval Wall 01. I have the Diffuse one up here. I have the Roughness over here, which is actually plugged into the Metallic, not the Roughness, please don't arrest me. Then I have a Displacement texture here, which is plugged into the Height input of a Bump node, which goes straight into the Normal. But as you can see, things have gone a little bit more complex down the bottom here. And what's happening here is I'm generating a bunch of artificial looking circles. Then I'm mixing those circles with the displacement of the medieval wall. And then I'm using that as a height input for the displacement, which is going to guide the adaptive subdivision to say where to extrude from the surface of the plane. So we can take a deeper look at this in the nodes here. I have two Voronoi textures, one at F1 and one at an N sphere radius. I'm then using two math nodes to make a comparison and then a subtraction and then adding this result to the displacement texture, which is coming in on the first color input. And you can see what this node group produces here on the right. You see we have some overlapping circles and they're kind of chopping into each other a little bit. But then if we want to see the final effect for this, if we look back at the image, we have the medieval wall that has these random circular imprints in them. And I think this makes it look kind of strange and artificially science fiction. And that's something I do like because it helps to break up the monotony of the random sticking up mountains and valleys of the same texture over and over again. Now let's talk a bit more about the design of the scene again. In this first image here, I liked the walls and I liked the light that was bleeding out over the walls. Basically, I had an emissive strip behind these up here and the light from this strip is bouncing off the top of the ceiling and coming back in. There's also an emissive strip underneath the bridge as well, which is quite high strength. And what that's doing is it's bleeding blue light sideways and upwards towards these walls. So this is how we get the blue lighting effect coming onto the wall here. And it doesn't make it all the way up. So it kind of implies to us that there's some kind of energy below this bridge. One thing I didn't like was this straight line here along the top. I thought this is way too basic, so I needed to do something more interesting. And if we come down to the next image, you can see where I have done this. I have instead got a curvature going up the top here. And I thought that this still wasn't enough, so what I did was I added these extra physical elements here where they curve back at the top and then come all the way back towards where the camera is. Now these looked a bit too simple and blocky by themselves, so I thinned out some of them, as you can see here. The ones closer to the doorway are thinner, whereas the ones further away are thicker. And the height of the doorway or gateway has also been elongated upwards. This means that I have less space to fill in with extra details. See so if we look back to the first one, there's some extra space above here where I need to do something. But down here I don't need to worry about it because it just blends into the other shapes. In the final image down here, you can see that I've made a design choice about removing some of the extra light behind the gateway. And the reason for this is because it also bled onto the side walls. You can see that there's light affecting these walls here. And I did like that there was a harsh cutoff point for the wall. Now this is just a personal preference thing. I'm sure that some people out there would actually prefer to have this extra light, but there's no right or wrong answer. Both versions are available. Now for this starry night effect I've got going on the ceiling here behind these detail elements. This is again using a Voronoi texture, using the color ramp to pinch down most of the area until we have just points left, and then passing this for an emission shader. 
Now as for improvising scene construction again, talking about our technique of symmetry, one thing I have talked about in other videos as well is using asymmetry to counter symmetry. So if we build most of our scene along a mirrored line, then we need some things to separate the left from the right, or the up from the down, or whatever transform or orientation you want to mirror. So notice here that the detail on the displaced walls is different from the right side to the left. The circles are in different places. Our character here is not standing in the middle, they're standing on the right. And our extra characters down here are on the left. Even small amounts of asymmetrical detail, especially if they're given a definite purpose, for example in this case is to show a sense of depth and distance, can go a long way. But of course, providing asymmetrical details to make it look like the image isn't completely mirrored is something that we don't necessarily need to worry about when using the pathing technique like we have up here. Because in this case, the amount of empty space available on both sides of the path is immediately different. And you can use this information to inspire you into new choices of what to place there. For example, if I have a pathway, I expect that there's places for someone to sit. So I would like to add a bench, but there's more space for a bench on the right side than there is on the left. So if there's space available on the left, then what else would be here? But if people are trying to find their way, then I expect that there's going to be some kind of signage. So I can put that on the left side here instead, because it's more appropriate to the level of space. So anyway, we've talked about a fair number of things in this. I don't think I've done a video quite like this before, where I just sit down and annotate the artwork and just break things down bit by bit and follow along with the full processes. But hopefully you found this interesting, and please let me know if you want me to do more stuff like this in the future. Here we've only taken a look at a couple of scenes, and I've been doing quite a few of these recently. I'm just riding the wave and trying to get this abstract architecture phase out of my system. But as I say, these files are available on the Patreon. And if you want to have a go at making some scenes like this by yourself, then make sure to tag me in your work because I'll be really interested in seeing how they turn out. So yeah, thanks for watching everyone. Don't forget to follow me on social media to get updated with new content. You can also join our Discord server to take part in discussions, share your work, and get sneak previews of upcoming projects. So thanks for watching everyone, stay safe, and I'll see you next time.